Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Measuring and Maximizing the Business Impact of Network Automation. As a quick introduction, my name is Morgan Stern. I'm the Vice President of Automation Strategy at Itential. Today's webinar is focused on methods for tying the technical benefits of automation to business metrics. This should be useful both for technologists and for business leaders. It'll give them tools to align on a common language for describing and measuring the benefits of network automation. In today's session, I'm going to explain why metrics are critical for network automation to evolve. I'll explain how the factory model relates to network automation and how choices that automation teams make have an impact on business value. I'll also define the four key metrics for network automation, and I'll provide some real world examples of these metrics. Finally, I'll describe how to use these metrics, both in the planning phases of automation, as well as in measuring and managing automation success in the operational phases. Before we dig in, I wanted to talk about the motivations for this session by explaining why I think a metrics-driven approach makes sense. Given all the momentum that's been building in the automation space, it's clear that automation is moving from the experimenting, experiment, experimentation and early phases into the mainstream for many organizations. As with any technology, when this happens, leadership starts to focus on business impact. They want to understand in detail how the technology is going to help them achieve their business objectives. Because of this, it's going to be critical for automation teams to start thinking about how automation will not just help them do their jobs more effectively, but how automation will benefit the company. So goal number one is to identify the metrics that clearly quantify business impact. Goal two is to identify metrics that enable informed decisions for automation. High-level goals like OPEX reduction are directional, but they're not particularly useful for decision-making. For example, there's lots of ways to reduce OPEX that have nothing to do with automation. So it's important to look for metrics that are appropriate and can provide insights that differentiate between multiple potential approaches. Goal three, is to create a common language that can be used by both the technology teams and by the business leadership. For the technologists, it gives them a framework to guide technical decisions for evolving their automation environment, while the business leadership will use those same metrics to make future investment decisions and to quantify the impact of the automation initiatives. Goal four, is to define metrics that can be useful both in the technology evaluation phases as well in operations. While a number of organizations have already implemented automation, many are embarking on initiatives to scale those efforts to a much larger audience. To do that, they'll need to evaluate whether their existing solution is robust enough to perform at scale. And if not, they'll need to evaluate other options. By selecting the right metrics, they can evaluate those options, not only on technical capabilities, but also on those options' ability to maximize business impact. Once the solution has been implemented, those same metrics can be used to provide quantified evidence that the benefits have been realized. With the goals identified, let's dig in. Most of you are familiar with Elon Musk's efforts to drive innovation in the automotive industry. Back in 18, there was a lot of press that highlighted the struggles that Tesla was having in their attempts to mass produce its cars. When the Model 7 was unveiled, Musk made some comments on those struggles. By talking about how it was relatively easy to build one car, but it was significantly harder to create a manufacturing system that could create those cars at scale. This challenge is not specific to building cars. It applies to a lot of industries, including network automation. To better illustrate this, I'd like to talk for a couple minutes about the evolution of production and industry. In virtually any industry, production starts with individuals who innovate. Prior to the industrial age, these individual artisans created their products by hand. 
They realized they can improve their market by coming together and forming cottage industries. Later, the introduction of methods like assembly lines enabled manufacturers to scale their operations dramatically. By achieving this level of scale, they got a lot of benefits. They could reduce their costs of production. They could improve the productivity of their workers. They could develop their products faster and they could make more kinds of things. I believe strongly that for automation to realize its potential, it needs to go through a similar revolution. Individual engineers will expand their efforts to teams and then ultimately to entire organizations by creating environments and processes that enable them to generate and execute automations at scale. The challenge then becomes, how can technologists select for platforms, tools, and processes that will enable them to create an automation factory that will deliver the best results? In the manufacturing world, it's relatively easy to see that not all factories are equal. Factors such as efficiency and productivity, speed, versatility, and the cost to build and maintain the factory can and do differ in significant ways. These factors make all the difference in a number of areas, such as how many products that factory can generate in a given period of time, how quickly that factory can adapt to create a variety of products, and how many people are required to operate the factory. This is where choices make all the difference. Folks who implement automation are faced with a number of decisions when they design their solution. First, they need to make decisions about the components they're gonna use. Are they gonna build the solution by create, combining or creating loosely coupled collection of bespoke elements? Or will they focus on selecting components that are modular and reusable? Second, will they create the components themselves or will they purchase the components? For this choice, they need to weigh the benefits of having a custom-built solution with the associated costs for upkeep, time, and technical debt versus purchasing a pre-built solution. Third, they need to consider the impact radius that the solution will need. Do they only need to automate a small set of use cases for a limited number of devices? Or does the business need the ability to autom automate across multiple technology domains and business processes? on a high quantity of devices at high volumes. Fourth, they need to evaluate the costs and benefits of implementing disconnected islands of automation versus a larger connected automation platform strategy. With the island approach, teams are able to select the specific tooling that works for their specific use cases, but if each team selects for a different set of tools, it creates complications when the business requires end-to-end -end cross team automation. The connected strategy may require coordination, alignment, and agreements up front, but once it's in place, teams can deploy use cases that deliver end-to-end -end cross organizational automotion automations. At this point, it may not be entirely clear, like what does this have to do with automation? While everything I've said is relevant to any kind of mass production, it's especially relevant right now in the automation space. There's a large and growing number of automation tools for engineers to choose from. My assertion is that while many tools can do good things, the strategy of how those tools are implemented and utilized, the way they're integrated with each other, and the metrics used to measure the effectiveness of those tools will make all the difference in maximizing benefits to the business. The same set of tools in two different environments, if they're deployed different ways, can have dramatically different impact on the business. It's time to evolve from pockets of automation to a more strategic approach guided by metrics focused on automation. To create what we consider to be the key metrics for network automation, our team looked at a wide variety of use cases and implementations, covering different business processes, technology domains, and industries. Based on that analysis, we arrived at these four metrics. I'll use this slide to briefly introduce them, and I'll focus on the significance of each metric related to how it should be used in evaluating tools, platforms, and strategies 
as part of implementing a more comprehensive automation solution. I'll go into detail on each one of them in the following slides. The first we call workload unit cost. The goal here is to prioritize around solutions that will offer the lowest cost per unit of automation, and I'll explain what that is shortly. The second is efficiency and productivity. Here, the focus is maximizing productivity by prioritizing for solutions that require the least manual intervention throughout the automation, meaning the fewer people required to run the system, the better. Third is time to complete, or how long it takes for an automation use case to execute, from the time the task is identified to when it is 100% complete. During solution evaluation, designers should prioritize on platforms that can automate as much of the overall business process as possible to reduce time to complete. The fourth is versatility and reach. Here, the selection criteria are focused on prioritizing solutions that provide high levels of versatility and the ability to connect to the network, systems, and tools at scale. You'll notice this is a very different approach than the high-level goals like OPEX reduction or revenue growth. Instead, these reframe targets around cost, time, and flexibility, so they're oriented around specific automation targets. Now let's look at each one of these metrics in more detail. The first metric is workload unit cost. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, workload unit cost focuses not only on the total cost of the automation system, but on the cost of that system in relation to how many activities it has completed or will complete. When I use the term activities, I'm really talking about a business process. So things like upgrade a network device or provision a customer, those are the kinds of things I have in mind when I talk about activities. I'm intentionally focusing on activities that represent the completion of a process and not the individual steps of the process. The more activities the system completes, the lower the workload unit cost. You'll notice that this metric has some relation to some of the other metrics, such as versatility and reach. If I can automate a wider range of activities, then the quantity of my total activities can increase significantly, which gives me an opportunity to reduce my workload unit cost. One question that comes up when people try to calculate workload unit cost is how best to capture and represent the costs. I'll have more details in a minute, but at a high level, we recommend to look at the total costs associated with the automation system over a sufficient period of time. It's usually three to five years in most of the situations. You can then prorate those costs to do calculations for shorter time periods, such as month, quarter, or a year. When I talk about costs, I'm talking about all of the costs, the cost of the software, the implementation costs, the ongoing lifecycle costs, as well as costs that are frequently underestimated or underrepresented. For implementation costs, this needs to include all of the time and effort associated with installation and configuration of the platforms, development of the automation components for the initial use cases, testing, and then the production launch. The ongoing life cycle costs, uh, the ongoing lifecycle costs are focused on hosting and administration of the platform, growing the platform, as well as developing new automations and updating existing automations. Then, then there's the hidden costs. Hidden costs include things like the lifecycle cost and technical debt associated with open source or internally developed systems, the support costs paid to vendors or third parties, professional services costs per, for development and integration, and costs for automations that still contain significant manual effort to perform activities like data collection, handoffs between groups, communications, ticket passing, or other manual steps. These costs will be based on the amount of human effort required and the labor rate of the resources that will be, before, be performing the activities. Once you've identified and calculated these costs, 
The next step is to calculate the total quantity of activities that the, that the platform will automate and divide that total by the cost, and then you have the workload unit cost. I'll show an example of this in a little bit. The next metric is efficiency and productivity. This metric is primarily focused on the quantity of people involved in and required to perform any manual steps that still remain once you've automated. To calculate this metric, you take that same number of activities that you used for the workload unit cost metric, and then you divide that by the number of people that need to participate in any manual steps in the automations. To be more specific, I'm talking about those steps that require human interaction, like data inputs for doing things like adding configuration variables or performing reviews, like typically happen with pre and post checks, uh, doing approvals. We're doing interactions with OSS systems to either get data or input data. One benefit of this metric is that it highlights the differences between automation approaches that require a high level of manual activities versus those that can automate tasks by providing automated data collection, data manipulation, data analysis, auto approvals, things like that. In my previous webinar, we talked about the 10% versus the 100% automated solution. And this metric is designed around that concept. Some automation solutions focus entirely on automating the actual change to the network by creating a script that an engineer will use during a maintenance window. This is the 10% approach. What this approach fails to address are all of the other tasks in the overall process that happen before and after the maintenance window, such as the planning, the scheduling, the preparation work, the pre and post checks, and the closeout. That's the other 90%. When you compare the efficiency and productivity metric for an automation that requires a high amount of manual effort to an automation that requires little to no manual effort, the benefits become obvious. To illustrate this, consider the differences between two approaches to the same problem. In the first approach, the automation system performs a closed loop operation, receiving a trigger based on a network condition and implementing the change without any human intervention. In the second approach, an engineer receives the alert, identifies the problem, determines the solution, develops and tests the code, and then uses a script to automate the change. The first approach requires no human effort, except maybe an approval to confirm the change. The second approach is still automated, but it requires a much higher level of human effort. Approach one has an extremely high efficiency productivity value, while the second approach scores much lower on efficiency and productivity because of all that effort involved. This metric is proving to be very useful in comparing different approaches because it highlights the, dif the differences between those approaches in a way that becomes more meaningful to the business. The next metric is time to complete. Time to complete is focused on the total elapsed time for an activity to be completed, from the point the activity is requested to the point when it's finished, including any idle time due to handoffs, delays, approvals, or scheduling. During evaluation, teams should evaluate solutions based on their ability to offer the lowest feasible time to complete meaning prioritizing their selections on solutions that can automate the highest percentage of tasks in the activity and at the same time eliminate as much of the idle time as possible. Some processes, no matter how much automation you implement, will still have activities that must be performed manually. For example, automation can't speed up the time required to ship a device to a branch office. However, there are ways an automation platform can still improve total time to complete in these situations. By doing things like automating activities for st uh, and staging the network changes, and by listening to the network for notifications that the device has been powered on and ready for provisioning. By doing this, the automation system will eliminate or reduce the idle time, and it'll shorten the time to complete. To better illustrate this, let's take a look at an example activity. I've used similar slides like this in the past, so some of you are familiar with this, with this diagram. In this case, 
we're looking at activities involved in SD-WAN site implementation. You'll notice that this process has a significant amount of time and activity related to planning, scheduling, design, and preparation being performed by a number of people from different groups like security, planning, engineering, and NOC. This process includes a fair amount of idle time due to all the approvals and handoffs between groups and for things like transportation and delivery of hardware. In most processes like this, this idle time is the primary contributor to high time to complete. Requests will sit in email boxes or in ticketing systems, and they may sit there for a while before the next person in the chain performs their activity. An automation approach that's exclusively focused on provisioning the device only doesn't do anything to reduce the time to complete for these activities, but a solution that can interact across the teams and the related systems will accelerate process completion by doing things like performing automatic approvals when certain conditions are met, or like gathering information from systems instead of waiting for manual inputs or spreadsheets. The critical factor in this case is to select an automation approach that has the capability to do this. Time to complete is closely connected to service level agreements. Today, SLAs are based on human processes with allowances for reasonable timeframes for things like handoffs, idle time, or other similar factors. Effective automation enables teams to significantly shorten the time to complete, which means they can deliver their services well under their SLA. This is a good place to be. The automation team can look for opportunities to be incentivized for executing much faster than the SLA, instead of having to worry about being penalized for being late. As automation becomes more pervasive though, I have no doubt that SLAs are going to be evolved on the expectation that automated processes should be delivered faster. Once this happens, it's gonna be really important for automation teams to have the ability to capture performance statistics from the automation platform. That way they'll be able to demonstrate SLA adherence. Another benefit to capturing the automation performance statistics is that those statistics can be analyzed to determine at the task level where the automation is performing well and where it's not. In the process world, there's an important concept called variability. In this case, variability would be a measurement that quantifies how far out of average a given task takes to perform one time. Tasks with low variability are very consistent and predictable. The task takes roughly the same amount of time to perform every time. Let's use 15 minutes as an example. For a low variability task, every time it runs, it takes 15 minutes. A task with high variability is different. It could take on average the same 15 minutes to perform, but sometimes it might be two minutes, another time it might be two hours. A process that contains a large number of high variability tasks is horrible for SLAs. Because if each task took the worst case path, the process would exceed the SLA. By using an automation system that provides detailed visibility and statistics on task execution, teams can identify those tasks that have high variability and they can take steps to mitigate that variability. Without statistics, the only information a customer would have is that they received their service late. With a good level of visibility, the automation team team can pinpoint exactly where the delays are occurring, or more importantly, they can pinpoint exactly where the delay is occurring in real time by receiving a notification from the automation system. That gives them the ability to take steps to proactively address the delay. But the only way to do this is to have an automation system that can provide that level of information and visibility. The fourth and final metric is versatility and reach. These refer to two different but related concepts. And by this, I mean they address similar questions. How flexible is the platform for automating different kinds of activities? And how scalable is the solution to address high volumes of activities, devices, and domains? The math for calculating versatility and reach is not as straightforward as the other three, but we've had some success in using an approach that I'll talk about shortly. When you look at this metric, you want to identify which of the items identified here makes sense within the context 
of your organization and business needs. For some, the total number of network elements to be managed will be extremely high. So the ability to deliver automation capabilities and performance at high scale will be important. For others, the complexity and diversity of use cases that can be automated will be important. Think of environments that require interactions with physical network elements along with cloud environments and other technologies. At this point, it's really important to bring up the notion of use case complexity. In the network automation world, there are a number of methods for defining the complexity of a use case. On the low complexity end of the scale, there are activities like simple configuration changes, while high complexity activities might require automations that involve multiple domains, multiple elements, and frequent interactions with OSS or ITSM systems. At iTential, we advocate for a right tool for the job approach. What I mean by this is that automation teams are most effective when they select tools that are best suited for a given task. Some tools are very effective at performing low complexity activities very quickly at a high scale, but they're difficult to work with when attempting to do more complex activities like service orchestration. The motivation behind including a consideration for the level of complexity in this metric is to reinforce the importance of evaluating and measuring any automation solution by its suitability to automate the unique workload requirements for every, any given group. Because there's no easy formula, formula for calculating versatility and reach, we at iTential recommend a table or a matrix, matrix model, which we'll see on the next slide. This is an example matrix for evaluating the suitability of a specific automation solution to address a group's priorities. The factors on the, uh, the, the left include requirements such as the ability to automate complex activities and the ability for the system to provide exposure to other internal customers via a portal, an API, or by events. On the right, the table lists each of the factors with the horizontal axis representing the level of importance that the organization has assigned to each factor. With low importance being assigned zeros or ones and higher importance being assigned twos and threes. Teams that are in automation platform selection phase or in the evolution phase can use this metric to evaluate the suitability of any given solution to meet the organization's priorities. After implementation, this metric can be used in a few ways. It can be used to benchmark the solution to see how well it delivered against those priorities. And it can also be used to measure the growth curve and the maturity of the solution as it automates use cases that require greater scale or reach over time. The factors that make up this table will be very situation and organization specific. What's important to one group may have very little significance to another team. Our, recommend, our recommendation is to use this as a model, but to customize it for your team's specific priorities and business requirements. Now that I've covered the four metrics, I'd like to show some examples based on use cases that iTential users have automated recently. The first use case was focused on the planning, engineering, and configuration of new mobile edge compute sites, specifically focused on the creation of the switch fabric and the integration with the network and network controllers. The units we used for this metric were the switch fabrics. So in this example, the pre-automation cost was calculated to be $18,785. Through automation, the team was enabled, enabled to eliminate a lot of manual effort by doing things like moving from manual data collection to electronic sources of data. Additionally, they were able to automate provisioning both to the devices and to the overlay controllers through integrations. With automation, the workload unit cost went from that 18,000 number to $1,450 meaning it required less than 10% of the manual effort hours to perform this use case with automation. The metric highlighted in the second use case is efficiency and productivity. For this use case, the team looked at the productivity gained through automation for device upgrades. 
In the pre-automated scenario, one engineer could upgrade two devices in a maintenance window. So we calculated that EP metric at two. Once the team deployed automation, a single engineer upgraded 80 routers in a maintenance window. What was interesting about this use case was that once they implemented automation, it wasn't the automation system that defined the upper boundary of how many devices they could upgrade in a maintenance window. The limit was really driven by concerns raised by the operations and networking teams about making too many simultaneous changes to the network. I think we're gonna see a lot more situations like this, where once you eliminate the human factor in processes, the automation system has the capability to go a lot faster than other parts of the business. So I think the constraints will move from some of the network change activities to other factors. The third use case is focused on time to complete. In this use case, the team automated a process for provisioning of enterprise mobility customers. In the pre-automated environment, the end-to-end -end process took 42 days on average, while the automated version took only two days. There were a number of reasons why the pre-automation interval was long. For one, there were multiple handoffs that teams that needed to participate in the activation process had to be involved in. A big part of the automation team's ability to reduce that interval by such a large factor was that they were able to get buy-in from all of the stakeholders and agreements that the system would automate 100% of the process. One of the business benefits for this use case was that the organization could start billing for service one day after the order was placed instead of having to wait a month and a half. So in this case, the benefit wasn't only on cost reduction, but on revenue acceleration. Since Itential started back in 2014, we've been working with our customers not only to deploy software, but also to help them develop their financial justifications for deploying automation. Financial justification is a critical step for most teams because it can be challenging to quantify all of the components and to accurately project with precision what the benefits of automation will be. Over time, we've come to recommend an iterative approach to financial analysis, and we develop tools to assist teams in developing their justifications. The first step is a preliminary analysis to identify the use cases with the highest potential for business benefits. We've created a tool called the Automation Value Calculator available on our website, the link is below, to assist with this. By using the calculator, teams can quickly uh, estimate the rough order of magnitude benefits for a variety of use cases, and then select those that look the most promising for a more detailed analysis, which is the second step. During detailed analysis, the team will perform a deep dive into the use case, examining a number of factors, including, <clears throat> including the time required, the team members involved, the data requirements, the cost to execute, and any dependencies. They'll also project the impact that automation will have on the process, both in terms of reduction of effort, which impacts the workload unit cost, and the duration of the overall process, which is tied to time to complete. This detailed analysis, along with the four metrics, can be presented to business leadership to justify the automation investment. Once it's been justified and it's been put into production, we recommend a third step focused on validation and reporting. As I mentioned in a recent blog post, there's two objectives for this step. First, it can be used to provide leadership with quantified data to demonstrate that the automation system delivered on the business benefits identified in the previous steps. Second, you will provide empirical data that the automation team can use to refine the model and to improve the system for later use cases. There's a hidden assumption behind that third step, which is that the automation system will have the capability to provide sufficient operational data that can be used to calculate the actual results gained through automation. This is related to the earlier points I made on the importance of having a platform that can provide statistics and performance data. Without this capability, there's no effective method for generating any kind of empirical data.
As we get towards the end of the session, I'd like to talk again on how teams can use these metrics. First, they can use them as an evaluation tool. For each automation solution that they're considering, they can ask sim questions similar to the ones on this slide. For workload unit cost, they can ask which solution will have the capacity and total cost of ownership to provide the lowest workload unit cost. For time to complete, they can ask which solution has the ability to automate as much of the process as possible and eliminate idle time to provide the shortest possible time to complete. For productivity and efficiency, they can ask which solution requires the least human interaction for activities that could be performed by automations, such as accessing an inventory database or checking with the network. And then for versatility and reach, they can ask which solution is best aligned with the priorities and requirements of each company's environment and use case. The second use for the metrics is for communications with executive leadership. They can use this information to measure and socialize the benefits, and it can be used as a guide for future investment decisions. First, teams can use the metrics as part of their business justification to establish a model for measuring the impact of automation solution and setting expectations. Then they can use the metrics to set targets for existing or and new automation in initiatives. They can also use these to provide an executive dashboard to help keep executives informed of progress and success of the automation system. And they can be used by decision makers to be able to make more informed decisions about the direction for future automation initiatives. In closing, we at Attential believe that automation provides many opportunities to re-engineer business processes that can maximize business value. By thinking about automation as a mass production model like a factory, teams can incorporate metrics that matter for mass production environments. As I've said, we believe those key metrics are workload unit cost, efficiency and productivity, time to complete, and versatility. Finally, by using the metrics along with financial analysis, automation teams can provide executive leadership with a robust set of data, which they can use to make better investment decisions and to more effectively manage automation initiatives to maximize the benefits to the business. Thanks for your time today. Uh, next, we'll spend a few minutes answering any questions that have come up in the chat window. So give me one second and I will switch over. First question is, how do you collect the raw data to calculate the values for metrics once you've automated? Um, there are a couple different ways to do this. Uh, if you do have um, um, insight into how you're designing the automations, you can put in um, functions essentially that will capture the data. Uh, I know some systems do have the ability to generate uh, performance metrics, or at least they've got a, a place where they're storing the data to do that. Um, the important thing is whichever approach you're using is to make sure that you build in those hooks so that you're able to, to provide the data um, that can then be used for, for analysis. Uh, comment about quality improvement being missing. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I think that one of the things that we have seen in uh, automations is uh, an impact uh, around workload unit costs and especially around time to complete that is that is directly tied to quality. Uh, there is a benefit that once you get everything in the system and you move away from any kind of manual data inputs, uh, you move away from spreadsheets, you move away from people typing in CLIs, you eliminate a lot of manual er errors that come up due to, to manual issues. Uh, and so in some cases, um, we have worked on automating processes where in the previous uh, manual world, they were looking at rework factors of needing to do this you know, two times, three times to get it right for more complex activities. So by um, solely focusing on gathering the data electronically, either from the network or from IT systems or OSS, we're able to eliminate those errors 
Uh, and so there's that rework factor that goes away. So absolutely quality is, is, is part of this. Um, next question is, uh, as it relates to consulting, how do you see customers examining the business processes and measuring the components at each point? Uh, we know a tool is only as good in the data and accuracy of the measurements of the as-is business process. Uh, uh, very valid point. Uh, I think that this is one of the areas that we have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy in working with um, a pretty broad set of users on how best to capture the information. One of the things that we've seen is, uh, you know, if you ask engineers, they will typically give you the sunny day process. They say, well, how long does it take this step to complete? And they'll say, oh, it takes me 25 minutes, right? That is based on an assumption of no interruptions, uh, no multitasking uh, or any of those kinds of things. So, so asking engineers is a critical step, but it's not the only step. So, so part of this is spending the time uh, and and doing some, I would say, additional work to uh, to gather real data based on multiple iterations. And then, if you have access to systems that are involved in the manual processes. You can and, and they provide some data, you can use that data as well to, to capture a more realistic uh, estimate of, of the, the manual process. But um, this can be pretty time consuming. Um, I know we've done it enough times that we've, we've got some, some things in terms of tools uh, and approaches to, to streamline this, um, but it is a really important factor uh, because understanding what the current cost and time is is critical to, to being able to, to demonstrate the, the benefits. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna, um, one more question I've got, uh, how do you collect the raw data to calculate the value for the metrics once you've automated? Um, so this would be post automation, right? I talked a little bit about how you do data collection beforehand, post automation. Um, it's important to either uh, have the automation system give exposure to metrics and data, or as I said, to build in some hooks so that as part of a script, you may want to um, write logs to a file that uh, put the data into a consumable format um, that you can then use to, to collate and, um, and summarize. Um, but I think that the challenge that, that we've seen for a lot of folks is um, if you're using a disconnected set of scripting to do things, it's really hard to see the end to end. And so to actually get it to the point where you can show that data from an end to end standpoint requires some additional steps that um, a lot of times aren't, aren't done. And so that's something that, that kind of uh, ties to that slide where I talked about you can have the same tools but implemented in two different ways uh, will have radically different outcomes, both in terms of the actual impact and the ability to, to uh, measure and show that impact. So it, it's really important. Okay, um, I think what we'll do, I know a couple other questions came in. I think some of those we'll need to follow up um, with, uh, uh, with my email. I wanted to thank everybody for your participation and for the engagement. Uh, hopefully you found the webinar to be insightful and valuable. And if you have further questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we've got our contact information on this slide. Or you can visit our website, or if you've already got uh, contacts with an potential account manager uh, or delivery person, you can reach out to them. Thanks again, and have a great day.